Well, it was not a great interview. I'm glad we have people in this church who asked the tough questions <laughs> and who really put it to him. Robert, thanks for that interview. That was brilliant. Robert's about to come um, and bring us the word. And just to give you a wee bit of a, an explanation there um, in terms of the, the Jamore and, and us. Um, for years, my dad was the pastor of the Jamore Church. Um, and Holly's dad is now the pastor of the Jamore Church, and they worked together for quite a long time. Um, you know me as Jordan. You know Holly as Holly, but we were previously known as Jordan, son of Stephen, and Holly, son of Paul. So that's why there was a bit of the confusion there. So we had our, or sorry, daughter of Paul. <laughs> we'll need to cut that out of the recording, maybe. We'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Sorry, Holly. <laughs> daughter of Paul. I knew I was going to make a mistake. But hey, folks, we at Carrick Nazarene, we don't only want to honor God's word, but we also want to honor those who bring us God's word as well. So as Robert comes to the platform, why don't we just welcome him with a hand and say thank you for coming this morning. Yeah, let's, uh, let's pray for Robert as we enter into the word. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your messenger this morning. And Lord, as Holly has already said, Lord, we open our hearts and we open our ears to hear your word this morning. Lord, no matter what our week has looked like, be it good, bad, or somewhere in between, Lord, we ask that your presence would be known in this place in a special way. That each and every person would know that they are loved by you, seen by you, and Lord, known by you. And so, Lord, we just thank you for Robert, and Lord, we thank you for the word that we're about to hear this morning. And in Jesus' name, the church said, amen. Well, it's good to actually be here with you and see sun shining. I often heard that Carrick was like the Northern Ireland Riviera. <laughs> now, now it's sort of been confirmed for me. Uh, over the years in the fire service, I've had quite a few guys from this sort of area, and uh, they're always bragging about it. But you have a, a beautiful place, beautiful church, and beautiful people, which makes such a difference when you walk through the door. So you guys, thank you for being fathers for being grandfathers. And there may be the odd great grandfather in here. Is there? Oh, fantastic. Good to see. Uh, and the value and the contribution that you make to your children, your grandchildren, your great child, grandchildren can never be underestimated. As I said earlier on, the difference between having our children and our grandchildren, there's a unique difference to the time the motivation and the energy that we can devote to actually help bring them up. However, in a world that's out to destroy a positive view of fatherhood and fathers and men in general, uh, what masculinity and what a father actually looks like, some of our major retailers, and you may have felt, had this email, some of our major retailers were sending out emails relating to Father Day. This may be a very traumatic day for many of you. And if you want to opt out from these messages, please do so. What a statement that is about men and about fatherhood. Now, you may be in that position yourself where this is probably the worst day for you to remember anything. You may have had an abusive father, and a neglectful father, absent father, just someone that just was too busy doing other things. And that may be the case. And if that is the case, forgive us as men. Forgive us as fathers. Forgive us as brothers, siblings, as grandfathers and as great-grandfathers. Because that is not what your heavenly father wished for you. And when you see words like he is a good, good father, unfortunately, we view God the Father through the experiences that we have had with our earthly father. And for some, that could be good, bad, or indifferent. And I certainly in no way want to belittle the pain or the suffering that anyone has, has encountered on this journey with men or with fathers. But we do have a good, good father. And we'll talk a little bit about that. 
When you look at how the media portrays us as men, in fact, we have a neighbor that moved in shortly after us when we moved into our home in December and was, was pointed out earlier on, some of us get up quite early in the morning uh, and I'm getting up to go to work at five o'clock. I like to get in and do a quiet time before I get there. And as I'm getting up to work to drive at maybe half five, he's up in a room gaming. Now, he may be a consultant for gaming. He may be somebody that that's his livelihood. But I'm thinking, at half five in the morning, what are you doing on that? Where is your wife? And I don't believe they have any children just yet. What is that? What virtual world is he living in that he's not connected to the rest of what's going on around him? There was a survey done by the World Health Organization in around, I think, 2001 that says something like 93% of our time is spent indoors in a virtual reality, a false reality, with a false weather system in our homes. We've got central heating and all that sort of stuff. We've got synthetic chairs and furnishings and all the rest of that. We don't really touch the reality of God's wilderness and God's creation as much as we think that we actually do. So in all of that, our media portrays us as men as you look at how the movies have now changed to the heroes. Business, the, obviously women are excelling in that where men are if you look at our education and how their uh, air levels are being reported against male, females and all that, right down to almost fathers are no longer required. Uh, you don't actually need them even to have children anymore other than one small component. You don't actually have them to be there anymore. So fathers are almost redundant and no longer required. What is it to be a man in this day and age? If you take out what the media say about us, what does it actually mean for us to be a man? What does it look like? I'm going to try and boil it down to a few wee things this morning. And I'm going to boil it down. What did God mean when he meant men? What did God mean when he meant you? You were created with the design and purpose in mind as a man. As a man of God. Not by accident, not by fluke, but he, he created you with plan and purpose in mind. What the world wants to do is to isolate you, separate you, disqualify you, or distract you from being the man that God has called you to be. I'm going to look at Genesis chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles with you. And we'll be sort of jumping between Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3 and some of the verses in there and due to time constraints. I just want to try and focus on, on the main parts before, we get, before I get distracted. You've all been brought up in the movie Up, haven't you? You're all familiar with it? And the dogs see the, the squirrel on their way? I'm a wee bit like that, so forgive me for that. Genesis 2 verses 8 and 9, then we'll be jumping to 15 and 17. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground and trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17 then. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it to take care of it, and the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Then we're going on to verses 18 to 20. Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will create a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see that he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. Genesis 3, 1 to 9. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild, other wild animals, and the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the, the, from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat 
from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? There's a couple of things to note in there. First one was on the first take of this, Adam's going, Eve, Eve, fig leaves, not nettles. <laughs> Forgive me for my, my strange sense of humor. That was a, a Milton Jones version of that. Uh, can you imagine what that would be like when Adam and Eve heard God coming down in the cool of the evening on a regular night? Where their daddy was so delighted in everything that they were doing, he would come down and have a walk with them. What that must have been like when you're walking with God, he says, well, what do you do today, Adam? Well, I'd I, I seen this big thing with a long neck and a cold a giraffe. And he says to, it says to God, the Father, why did you create giraffes with such long necks? Anybody know? This is my dad joke coming. Wait for it to reach their heads. <laughs> would that not get on a dad joke? No? All right. Could you imagine what that would be like? Having that sort of relationship with your walking with God Asking those sort of things as a dad would be for an excited child. What the, the trophy that you've won? How did you do? What, what, did you, what did you dance? What did you see today? What did you discover today? Because this was a life of first. First time he's seen some of these creatures. The first time he actually put a name to them. To see the beautiful waterfalls, the blue lagoons. All of these things were first. Could you imagine the excitement in Adam to be able to tell his heavenly father what that was like? I can just about get my head around it. Here's the subtlety of what the enemy comes down. He starts to ask these questions. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Whereas we know he was the one that wanted to be like God. In fact, he wanted to be and wanted that worship and that adoration. And that's why he fell. Why did Adam not stop her? Oh, no, I thought you might have the answer. <laughs> when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gain and wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. He also gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. What was going on that Adam didn't do something about it? Because he was the one that was given the instruction, not Eve. He was given that instruction before Eve was actually a twinkle in his eye or in his rib. He was given the instruction. How did he pass that on to Eve? How accurate did he pass that on? And when God speaks into our lives and his truth, how do we pass that on to our wives and to our children as men? Why did he not rip the head off the serpent and stamp all over it? Because he was there, because she turned to him and he ate it. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 to 14. Men, and this is purely for us. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and let all you do be done in love. Why did he not do something? Why did he not stand firm in what God had told him? Be strong, rip the head off the serpent, but do that in love for his wife. I suggest for us to act like men, we need to be watchful. We need to stand firm in our faith. We need to be strong. And that everything we do, we do in love. That's how we will act like men. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
They hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden, but the, the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He didn't say, What have you done? He said, Where are you? He come looking for relationship. God the Father come looking for relationship, not condemnation. He come looking for relationship like he'd done on many evenings in the cool of the evening. He come down looking for, Adam, where are you? And he was hiding. If God the Father was to come into this room this morning and call your name, where would you be? What would you be hiding behind? Where was Adam hiding? Trees, well done. <laughs> You've all gone very quiet all of a sudden. He was hiding in the trees, hiding in the bushes. Can I suggest to you that was Adam's ministry? He was placed into the garden to tend it, to look after it. And when God come looking for him, he went hiding in his ministry. When God comes looking for you, where are you? What are you hiding from? Why are you hiding? What are you hiding behind? Or who are you hiding behind? Because when this came to light, the first thing Adam says, the woman you give me, that's all her fault. So not only was he only hiding behind his ministry, he was also blaming his wife. What is it to be and act like a man? Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like a man, be strong, let all you do in love. For me, when God asked me that question, I was hiding in ministry. I was failing as a husband, I was failing as a father, I was failing in ministry, and I was just about, you know what a sinkhole is? Everything looks perfect on the outside, but everything beneath it is just being pulled away and destroyed. And the veneer of a road surface or a street just looks like okay until it just collapses. That's what my life was like in around 2011. And what happened was a good friend of mine had asked me, we were in preparation for the World Police Fire Games, which was happening in 2013, uh, I have a good friend. Would you mind if he prays for you? Now, this guy had a prophetic ministry. And the closer it got to this guy coming to pray for me, I felt this guy's going to expose me for everything that I am and everything that I do. And the closer it got to are you familiar with in the Old, Temp, in the Old Testament when the high priest had to go into the holies of holies, he actually had bells around him and they actually tied a rope to him because if he was not ceremonially cleansed to the to tea, he died, and nobody could go in there and get him, and he would have to be dragged out. I actually felt that this guy was going to wipe the floor with me, just like what would have happened to the high priest. But what actually happened when that guy prayed over me, he used words like I had never heard before. Words of affirmation, words of initiation, and confirmation. And it actually took me about six months to actually realize what he was just doing was describing Jesus. It wasn't me at all. Which inspired me to actually live my life more like Christ. And that when I realized how my heavenly father seen me, changed the dynamic of my relationship with him. My father was at home, but totally disengaged. Never once do I remember him disciplining me. Never once do I remember him raising his voice to me. So was, my opinion of God the Father was, yeah, he's way up there, but he ain't really that interested in me. I knew he was there, but not really that interested in the minutia and the nitty gritty of my life, which is a different story to what's painted here in Genesis when the Heavenly Father came down to walk in the cool of the evening with Adam and with Eve. That's how we view through the lenses of our fathers, our, our own fathers, what God the Father looks like. Whether he's like Gandalf the Grey or Gandalf the White or 
he's an authoritarian, he's abusive, he's verbally abusive. I was sitting with a young man about three, four weeks ago, and he was telling me about a wee bit of his journey, and I asked him, well, how are you with the Holy Spirit? Oh, great, I believe in prophetic men, and I believe all of this, and the Holy Spirit's great. How are you with Jesus? Yes, uh, Jesus is my Savior. He died on the cross for me, he rose from the dead. How are you with the Heavenly Father? No, don't do that. My earthly father is abusive. In fact, while I was with him, his, his father was sending him text. You're a failure, you're a disgrace, you're this and that. And he totally a blanked Father God because of his earthly father's relationship. So when your heavenly father comes looking for you, where are you? Are you hiding behind the pain of your earthly father? And please, I do not want to do an, an, an injustice to that pain and that suffering. But you have a heavenly father that sent his only son to die for you, that you may have a relationship with him like you have never experienced before. That's the sort of father that you have in your, in the, your heavenly father. What are you hiding behind? We get caught up with acts of services about doing rather than being with our Heavenly Father. Being in relationship with Him as opposed to trying to earn His love. Trying to continually to earn it and buy it or because of the things that we try to do for Him. Jesus dealt with that for us by His death on the cross and His resurrection. Through Him, there is a way to our Heavenly Father. So what are you hiding behind? For me, it was ministry. I was running or leaving Farfetch Christ Northern Ireland and I was hiding further and further behind that. Being busy in church life, doing in church life, whether it's in kids ministry, whether it's even being the pastor here or whatever it is, what are you hiding behind when Heavenly Father comes looking for you and calls your name? Oh, I, I'm busy doing this for you, Lord. I, I've got, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm so busy here. Let me ask you, how many is, by show of hands, have actually been shown and trained and discipled on how to actually have a quiet time? That's about six. Wow. I say wow, but reality, that's where we are. We're almost expected as an infant that you're now a Christian, you now know how to get on with that. You know how to change your nappy, you know how to feed, you know how to go to solids. But yet, we don't do that in church. Forgive us for not doing that for you or with you. And journey in life with you as life is so difficult, not just for families, but also for men. Can I invite you to speak to pastor about journeying something like that where you can actually be, and it doesn't matter what age you are, the skill of a quiet time and what does it look like to have an intimate personal relationship with your heavenly father on a regular basis and that joy and the pleasure that comes with that, almost like Adam, that you're actually waiting for him and coming down in the cool of the evening to actually spend time with your heavenly father Rather than, I had got to the point where I couldn't even look myself in the mirror. That explains the baldness. I'm not actually bald, I just kept shaving in the wrong direction. But that's the thing about it. I couldn't even look myself in the face in the mirror because I was so ashamed of who I am and what I had become until the, the Father intervened. When I realized it's about my relationship with Him, not by what I can earn and what I have to work at to try and be a better man, a better father, and a better husband. You will identify this whether you're a mature gentleman or a young boy. There are certain questions that we have as children that actually echoes right into our adulthood. For we boys with their dads, is dad, do you see me? Do you delight in me? Do I have what it takes to be you? For we girls, it's, do you delight in me? Do you see me as a princess? Do you love me? Will you fight for me? Will you slay the dragon for me? 
The best way to explain this is that I've seen it with my grandchildren when we were in Texas in March. My granddaughter's come on seven. For every Disney movie that has a princess in it, she has the outfit. And she gets changed to watch the movie. Now, who trained her to do that? It's what is alive in her heart. She wants to know that her daddy loves her and delights in her and will fight for her, will be her strength. For we boys, James is just coming three. That's crashing and killing things, whether it's trucks or whatever it is, he's banging everything off, everything. He just wants to be, Daddy, do you see me? Do I have what it takes to be you, Daddy? His father's a firefighter. Um, and does all the, the manly things that you would expect in America, killing dead things and hanging them up on the walls. and That's a whole different story. But these are the questions that we have as children, but these are the questions that actually come into adulthood with us that we then start to hide behind as men. Do I have what it takes to be a father, to be a man, now to be a grandfather? Again, speak to pastor about this. There's, there's a journey that you can take that will give you that teaching, motivation, mobilization, and equipping to be the man of God that he has called you to be. You remember that we say sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you? That's a lie from the pit of hell. We do a, a series of material called uh, Every Man a Warrior. And in that, we look at raising children and we look at uh, marriage and what that looks like. And we have three biblical principles for raising our children. And this is where I'm going to finish for you now. Three biblical principles that you need to understand to raise children. It is a father's God-given responsibility to train his children. And that comes from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Principle number one. Principle number two. Children get their self-image from what they believe their father thinks of them. Children get their self-image from what they believe their father thinks of them. We get that from Proverbs 17, verse 6. The last one then, the words spoken to a child will determine their destiny. From Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat of its fruit. The words that you speak to your children and to your grandchildren will give them life or death. You have such an important part as a man, as a father, as a grandfather, as a great-grandfather to speak and to live these godly principles on raising our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. Never underestimate who and what you are and what you bring to your family. If you had never experienced your heavenly father in the context that I've spoken about as a good, good father, or if you've never experienced them or through Christ's death and resurrection, if you've never experienced that thing about salvation, now's the day to do something about it. Please stand with me as we bring this part to a close with prayer before the worship team come back up. If you have never experienced that good, good father side of God, and you would want to. Um, in fact, everybody just uh, bow your heads and close your eyes. If you have never experienced that good, good father aspect of your heavenly father, that you've always viewed him as distant, disconnected, disengaged, or just abusive, or hurtful, but you would want to experience that good, good father that we've talked about this morning. I want you just to put your hand up so we can pray for you, that you can experience the love of God, the father like you've never experienced before. If you have never experienced that personal, intimate relationship with God, that he would come and spend time with you like he did with Adam in the garden, 
and you would like to know Jesus as your personal Savior, that you can have that relationship with your Heavenly Father, please raise your hand so we can pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that through your word this morning we can understand and know your word and what you have given us even through the Old Testament stories in Genesis of that good, good father and that whole thing about relationship with the father that is deeply and intimately interested in everything in our life, that you want to come and have relationship with us as you did with Adam in the cool of the evening. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for those that have suffered at the hands of the earthly father, which has marred the view of our heavenly father. I pray you bring them clarity of heart and clarity of mind, that they will know you as you truly are, a loving, good, good father. <coughs> father, we thank you for those that raised their hand in acknowledgement of salvation. And I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. And I want you to follow me in that prayer. And please don't leave the church this morning without speaking to Pastor. As he can help you on your journey, your journey of faith and your journey with relationship with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I want to know you as my Father. I thank you for Jesus dying on the cross and providing a way for me where there was no way. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for maybe ignoring you as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I pray that you bring the joy of salvation into my heart, that I may live my life in you and for you. Thank you for Jesus dying for me and giving me life and life to the full in Jesus. Father, I pray your blessing and your protection on this church as they go after your heart and as you go after their hearts. I pray particularly for the men in this church that you will burn deeply into their hearts who and what they are as men of God that they will be strong men who will love and lead their families, that they will be watchful, that they will stand firm in the faith, that they will act like men, that they will be strong, and they will let everything that they do be, do be done in love. Father, we give you this this morning. We thank you that you are a good, good Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.